Hey everybody, welcome to This Week in Global Health. I am Jessica Taff, and with me today you will recognize some of our regular panelists, Brian Simpson, from our favorite news outlet, Global Health Now, and Souls in Bali. So say hi guys. Hi everybody. Hey. Great to, great to see you. <laughs> My wife just made a cameo appearance behind me there, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, if everyone didn't know already, it is NTD, Neglected Tropical Disease Awareness Week. It's actually the first ever, and this marks the signing of the London Declaration on NTDs. So as such, we are super excited to have Amy Maxman here with us today, who recently wrote a series on a disease that is so neglected, it's actually not even on the WHO NTD list. But before we talk to the fantastic Amy Maxman Solzen, um, can you talk to our audience and give our audience just a little background on mycetoma so they actually know what we're talking about? Absolutely, Jess. Um, mycetoma basically describes the clinical syndrome that is caused by the bacterial ectonomycetes or a fungal infection in the feet, hands, or upper extremities. This infection often starts with exposure through a break in the skin and progresses into more serious chronic inflammatory infection with lesions and formation of granular aggregates of these bacteria or fungi through the skin. Um, just so you get an idea, like this was described by Philip Manson, a physician in 1950s, as to look like excreting earthworms from the limb. So mycetoma is actually not a new condition. It was first described in mid-1800s and initially named Madara foot. Um, based on the place where it was first discovered, which happens to be in India, incidentally, Mathura. There is no cure for this disease, although some anti-infectives can be used, but they are not that effective. Amputation is quite often the end result, and this disease is so neglected that there is little research on its epidemiology or burden, despite it being known for 200 years. Wow. That's, that sounds really, really horrible, which I'm sure Amy can tell us a little more about in her experiences seeing it. But before we talk to Amy, um, Brian, this was part of a three-part series that Global Health Now did, and it came out of a contest that was put on through Global Health Now and the Consortium for Universities for Global Health. Can you tell us a little bit about this and why mycetoma was chosen? Sure, absolutely. Our, our goal uh, with this contest with CUGH was to really bring to the fore some of the untold stories of global health. All of us who work in global health and uh, have colleagues working in global health know that you know so much happens that isn't covered by the mainstream media. And so that was our mission, was to find these untold stories. We, we launched this. This was our first year for the contest last year. We had 170 nominations from all over the world. We thought that was a terrific response and also demonstrated you know, just that need for uh, greater coverage of these kind of untold stories. Um, and so we had uh, a tough time choosing the selection of mycetoma. Um, but after a careful review with our colleagues at CUGH, um, we really thought that you know this is a hugely important disease documented in 23 countries that is really just not on anybody's radar. And uh, the more we looked into it, the more it, it seemed to be like this was an important story that we wanted to tell. And we were very fortunate in being able to secure Amy Maxman to tell that story. So I have a question now for Amy. So Amy, you know, like how much did you know about this disease taking on this assignment? I understand that you spent a lot of time researching this assignment before going over to Sudan to cover it. What exactly did that involve? So I had never heard of it at all before Brian mentioned it to me. Mycetoma. It was a completely foreign name. It took a while just for me to figure out how to say it. So I had never heard of it. Um, and so then, yeah, I read the nice thing about it not having that much research having even though it's been known since like mid 1800s is that um, you can pretty much get through the literature there's not so much and of the scientists alive today who are working on it there's like five so I could talk to all of the key people involved or at least correspond with them um, and try and reach them um, so before I went I read everything I could um, and I think what really struck me was that the papers that are written you know in the mid 1800s not that much else is known today even. So, I mean, the fact that this is a disease that's sometimes caused by fungus, sometimes caused by bacteria, that alone sort of says a lot. That means it's sort of like just a syndrome. 
because usually it's there's a disease and there's just you know one class of parasites or bugs that's behind it. This is like 18 species of fungus, seven types of bacteria, maybe other things we don't really know. So that's uh, that was my reporting in advance of going, uh, just sort of getting a grasp of like everything that's known and also how little is known. Fascinating. So did you so did you have a background in uh, biology or in this field? So could you tell a little bit more about sure. yourself? I have a background in science. I got a PhD in evolutionary biology. Um, so I didn't study fungus, but I knew people who studied fungus. Um, and I immediately reached out to them to see if they had ever heard of it. Um, and they hadn't, but they were all very interested and they continue to be kind of interested. So um, that was my background in science. And then I spent, I think, um, you know, for a little bit less than a decade now I've been writing. And my interests have moved their evolution, but they're also now medicine, diseases, global health, that sort of thing. So, Amy, that's really interesting, I think, for both Sultan and I, because we both have biomedical PhD backgrounds. So it's fantastic to meet another biomedical scientist that's doing science communication and journalism, and especially from the disease side of it. And, uh, yeah. So, um, okay, so you did all this research just like a scientist would. You read everything, you know, you think you've got a handle on it, but then you went to Sudan. And do you think that your research prepared you for what you found when, you know, when you saw everything? I mean, tell us what it was like to actually experience, see this firsthand. Yeah, it's always so different. So I think the first thing I saw, and it was nice because I think I was emailing Brian during the course of some of these things. I think I, what I recall is that one of the first things I saw was um, I went to the Mycetoma Research Center in Khartoum in Sudan, and I saw um, an amputated foot and an amputated hand that had been cross-sectioned. And it was so disgusting because, well, also scientifically, not, not like nausea, just like it, it was like um, the entire hand or the entire foot is just full of like, uh, and I'm motioning with my hands, like clumps, right. this big, you know, ping pong ball sized clumps of fungus. Um, it reminded me of like seeing drawings of leaf cutter ant nests. I know that's not a normal thing to see, but I have maybe because I have an evolution background. But they have like fungal gardens. So an entire lint, like foot or hand would be full of this like fungus. So what struck me about that was like, why does anything get that bad? I mean, I was thinking kind of like athlete's foot, foot fungus. Like when I say I'm you know, when I told people I was reporting a foot fungal disease, they were like, yeah, who cares? <laughs> but this was, it's, a, it's insane how bad it is. So I think that was the first thing. And I think that sort of filled me also with the thought of, um, I just can't believe that it would get this bad if it weren't in, you know, such a poor country. Uh, and if it weren't such an understudied disease, because, um, yeah. And I, and I had just returned from, I had spent a few months in Sierra Leone during the Ebola outbreak, and that was the same sort of situation where, yes, this is a deadly virus, and it's a scary virus, but it would not be that bad, or as bad, I don't, I don't think, if it had been elsewhere. Um, this must have been a very emotional experience for you, seeing those, you know, people affected by this very disfiguring disease, uh, you know, for which there is no effective treatment. And it must have been very frustrating to know that, these extreme cases are just the tip of the iceberg, you know, end stage cases and many cases go unnoticed because they're not as severe as that or maybe people do not visit the clinic for fear of amputation. Now all of this must be making it quite difficult to get a good epidemiological estimate. And, you know, though this poses a major challenge for addressing the disease, you know, it must be difficult to convince policymakers to take notice only based on anecdotes without solid numbers. Can these kind of prevalence or incidence studies be done? Uh, gosh, it's hard to say. Well, we hope. We hope that they, that this is maybe these stories are one factor in driving recognition for the disease, which would perhaps prompt people who fund research to make grants available for scientists who would like to do epidemiology studies. Because right now, the disease takes place in countries where there may not be such a great health system. So even finding records of who has what, a diagnosed condition, that's, that's not a thing. You can't just go to a hospital and collect records because there's not records. Um, so th there needs to be good epidemiology done. And that does, doesn't take a lot of money, but it takes some money. 
um, yeah. I um I just want to go because you you know Solson brings up a good point about the advocacy and this is a disease that ha is not currently on the WHO NTD list which per potentially this is where advocacy can come in where people go in there they bring awareness journalism is bring raises the awareness level uh, I understand the WHO is actually talking about this um, tomorrow because we're everyone by the time this airs it will be tomorrow. Um, what are your thoughts, Amy, on that in, in terms of how the WHO has treated this, whether they'll go forward and include it on their NTD list, and what this means actually in doing something about this disease once hopefully it makes it onto that list? Yeah, well, so what the decision tomorrow is this, is whether or not to put it on the agenda to be discussed during the World Health Assembly, which is a meeting that occurs in May, I think, in which the... I, some number of member states, 160, I'm not sure if that's right, but around there, all of the member states that belong to the World Health Organization. So the, all of these policymakers will meet and then they will decide, is this something we want to add to the WHO's neglected disease list? So it's kind of two parts. On one hand, the WHO has to take the first step in saying, let's put this on the agenda. And then it's up to the leaders of the U.S. and the leaders of the U.K. and leaders of all of these countries that don't worry about mycetoma to say this is important enough that we want this to be on the list for the World Health Organization. And can I just jump in, Amy? Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit, a uh, little bit more about you know why this is so important to be on the list? That you know, because it, it can sound like oh well, you know, you can just add it to a website, no, no big deal but it actually makes a huge difference, isn't that, isn't that correct, to be yes. on the official list? It definitely does, because if you think of it from a funder's point of view, say you're, you know, if you're at a big funding agency and you have a scientist, you have scientists all want to do their project, and so if there's a scientist and they're saying, hey, there's this really important disease, we don't know how many people have it and nobody even, re and like the World Health Organization doesn't even really recognize it. I mean, I'm a funding agency with limited funds, why would I you know, give my funds to that person. So it's sort of the step that would allow either funding agencies to either put out a call for proposals to fund, say, an epidemiological study, or it would be enough so that if a researcher applies for a grant, they can point and say, look, WHO lists this as a highly neglected disease, so it is important to study. So my next question for you, uh, Amy, is obviously related, again, like coming back to the burden of disease. Like, I remember reading... Um, somewhere that, you know, every year Sudanese so hospitals roughly estimate there are 400 cases of mycetoma. Um, and this disease is endemic in Senegal, Sudan, Somalia, and even India and Mexico. Do you have any idea how mycetoma compares to the other neglected tropical diseases on the list in numbers or otherwise? Are there any commonalities between mycetoma and other entities? And can we use those commonalities to develop horizontal approaches to bring attention to them or treat them? So it's funny you ask that. That's pretty much exactly what the head of the Negle Neglected Disease Department at the WHO was talking about. So um, a lot of them do share a lot of commonalities. So for ex example, there's um, Beruli ulcer, which is nothing like mycetoma, is one of the neglected diseases. And again, we don't know much epidemiology there. So it's another situation where we, we don't really have many treatments. We don't really know how many cases. Um, so what people will argue in mycetoma is, well, you have Beruli ulcer on the list. Why not put mycetoma on the list? Um, the WHO has to also contend with this other idea of, well, there are commonalities. For example, all of them would really benefit from early reporting. So if you had a decent health system in which people could come to a health clinic and there was a nurse or health worker there who could write down the person had the disease and refer them for treatment, something as simple as that, that would at least be a first step. So on one hand they're saying there has to be these horizontal solutions and there's no way around that. There does need to be horizontal solutions. On the other side, if you don't put in, if you don't name the specific disease, we have this problem with funding. So I, I sort of see both both sides of it. And Amy, one of your one of your sources, I thought, made a great comment about that. It's like, it's like, yes, you know, we need the horizontal solutions, but you know, they're not going to be there tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so there's like a, definitely a time issue there too. It's like, you know, what if you can't make a difference now, you know, then we should move forward with that direction. I think. Yeah, I mean, ideally, you can do both. Right. This is definitely very fascinating. I mean, 
I have a question for you, you know you and Brian specifically as well. Uh, this was clearly a wonderful overview series on mystoma, and I'm sure most people would have never heard of this untold story um, as the contest describes it. Why are these stories important to tell? What purpose do they serve, and how can they play a role in bringing it to attention for the policymakers? Great. Amy, do you want to start off? Uh, well, I guess on my end, I can say as a writer, well, I'm <laughs> how maybe I should have Brian <laughs> answer that because I'm not sure I'm not sure how you can tell when things have an impact just yet. Yeah, I mean I think first of all, like you know, our goal has always been to to tell these stories um, that you know they these are important stories that deserve uh, the world's attention and what Amy found in Sudan were you know, horrific conditions. And you can see, like, in these personal stories, um, people whose, you know, dreams are, are lost, who are not being able to be, you know, who they could be, not being able to be productive, not being able to be part of their family or their village or their culture, really, because they've got this horrible disease. And um, as I think it was uh, Professor Ahmad Falal at um, the Mycetoma Research Center said, you know, if, if, if somebody... You know, people in the West will begin to care about this when they get sick from it, you know, and then things would happen. And, you know, I, I it would hope that um, that we can drive the kind of stories and attention and awareness that can make things happen without, you know, without people here having to be sick before the West would actually wake up and do something about it. And I would say just not not only just for the policymakers. I mean, we definitely want to raise awareness. But one of the reasons we do want to raise awareness is so that we have funding going into it just for those horizontal and those vertical approaches, which would be specific solutions, treatments, a cure, maybe, gosh, goodness, in the future for this this horrific disease. Um, but I I'd like to kind of leave on a, a positive note. And I understand from um, reading the series that. Uh, DNDI, Drugs for Neglected Diseases uh, Initiative, is is going forward with an actual clinical trial on mycetoma, which is wonderful considering what it seems, having read the article, that there just there hasn't been hardly any scientific advancements in this area for years and years. So this is what a milestone. So Amy, could you tell us a little bit what you know about that when that starts, and and you know how what this really means for the the field and for mycetoma. Um, yeah, it's pr it's very uh, it's excellent. So um, I think by May, DNDI hopes to begin this clinical trial, and they'll be doing it in conjunction with the um, the surgeon that Brian mentioned, Ahmed Fahal, at the Mycetoma Research Center in Khartoum. They'll be testing um, a drug that uh, a drug that had been developed for a different disease. They'll be testing two do two um, strengths of that medicine versus the current antifungal that's used that's not very good. Um, so that's going to be huge. I mean, if you can imagine being the kind of frustration you'd feel as a doctor uh, faced with patients and having to tell them they should buy drugs that may make them go broke, their family go broke, sell their refrigerator, sell their TV for drugs that may or may not even make a difference, and then having to amputate their limbs afterwards and just not knowing if you're even advising them to do the right thing, uh, that's hugely frustrating. Obviously, it's horrible for the patients, and I can also feel for the doctors. So it's a big deal even, so we hope the drugs are, that we really hope the drugs work, but even if they don't work, at least we learn uh, kind of quantitatively this is what the old drug does and what it doesn't do, and this is what this other thing does or doesn't do. Um, and DNDI is doing this for very little money. I think they're thinking, you know, no more than two million. Compare that with like a billion dollars that's usually spent on drug development. There's obviously some differences, but um, but they're being very efficient about it. And I also had the opportunity to meet the um, one of the lead investigators with DNDI, Natalie Straub uh, Wugroft, who's um, got a ton of experience in pharma, and she's just. Uh, super efficient, like uh, she was there and she's just quickly making decisions about what to do, what not to do. Um, and it's very cool. It's great news. That's, that's, that really is wonderful to hear that there's progress being made and I really hope that your series, the article, brings more attention and um, yeah, let's cross our fingers that this actually does get put on the list and something that action does happen and people uh, can 
be prevented from having this horrific disease. So I want to thank um, Amy and Brian for coming on to talk to us about the mycetoma and the Global Health Now series on it. Um, thank you so much. It was wonderful having you. And especially I'm excited that it's during NTD Awareness Week and hopefully this will, like I said, bring more awareness to mycetoma. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Jessica and uh, Suzanne, I want to say thank, thanks so much. And then also just want to like, uh, let everybody know that we'll be announcing our 2016 Untold Stories contest very soon. So uh, please keep an eye out for that and because uh, we'd love to hear uh, your untold stories. Well, we will definitely plug that. And um, on so our video, we'll have some links where you can find out more information about the Global Health Untold Stories contest and also links to Amy's series where people can get the entire story and uh, follow more on it. So thank you everybody for watching and we'll catch you next time on This Week in Global Health. So see you later. Thanks. Thanks everybody. Thanks.